Okay, we're going to continue with section 6.3, motion in an accelerated frame. Um, a motion in accelerated frames. Uh, Newton's laws of motion describe observations made in an inertial frame of reference. Let's analyze how Newton's laws apply to an observer in a non-inertial frame of reference, uh, an accelerating frame. Uh, as an example, let's look at an air hockey table on a train. Uh, the train moving at a constant velocity represents an inertial frame. The observer on the train sees the puck at rest remain at rest. Newton's first law appears to be obeyed. Um, the accelerating train is not an inertial frame. Observer on the train sees no apparent force on the puck, yet it accelerates from rest toward the back of the train. It appears to violate Newton's first law. Observations made in an inertial, in, in a non-inertial frame appear to be unexplained accelerations of objects not fastened to the frame. Uh, Newton's first law is not violated, of course. It appears, it appears to be violated because the observations are made from a non-inertial frame. The apparent force is called a fictitious force. It's not a real force, and it is due only to, not, to observations made in an accelerated reference frame. Uh, so uh, let's look at the statement. Fictitious force is an apparent force that seems to act on any mass described in an accelerating non-inertial frame of reference. Real forces always are interactions between objects. And you can't identify the second object uh, for a fictitious force. Okay, so a fictitious force uh, appears to act on an object in the same way as a real force. Um, real forces are always interactions between two objects, and you can't identify the second object for a fictitious force. In general, simple fictitious forces appear to act in a direction that is opposite the acceleration of non of the non-inertial frame. Example, the acceleration, the train accelerates forward, and it appears that the fictitious force, there's a fictitious force causing the puck to slide toward the back of the train. Um, all right, let's uh, talk more about fictitious forces. They can be due to a change in the direction of a velocity vector. Previously, we talked about the train going forward and backwards, but it could also be caused by a change in direction. Imagine a car traveling to, along a highway at a high speed and approaching a curved exit ramp. Uh, as the car takes the left turn, the person sitting in the passenger seat leans or slides to the right and hits the door. The force exerted by the door on the passenger keeps her from being ejected from the car. Uh, what causes her to move toward the door? Um, the incorrect belief is that a force acting toward the right pushes the passenger outward from the center of the circular path, often called the centrifugal force. That's a fictitious force. There is no such thing as a centrifugal force. It looks real and it appears real, but it's not. It's, just, it's what keeps the, what we think of keep, if you swing a bucket of water around in a circle, the, the water stays in the bucket, when really it's just the inertia of the water wanting to keep going in a straight motion and the bucket bottom and walls keeping it tied in, they provide the centripetal force that keeps the water in. Um, the car represents a non-inertial reference frame. The centripetal acceleration toward the center of its circular path, the passenger feels apparent, an apparent force which is outward from the center of the circular path in a direction opposite that of the acceleration. It is the passenger's own inertia that wants to keep her going straight. Think about Newton's laws. Before the car enters the ramp, the passenger is moving in a straight line path. As the car enters the ramp and travels the curved path, the passenger tends to move along an original straight line path. In Newton's first law, the natural tendency of an object is to continue moving in a straight line, the law of inertia. The force toward the center of the curvature acts on the passenger. She moves in a curved path along with the car. This force equals the force of friction between her and the car seat. If the friction force is not large enough and the seat follows a curved path while the passenger tends to continue a straight line path, from the point of the view of the observing the car, the passenger leads or slides to the right relative to the seat. 
Eventually, she encounters a door, which provides a force large enough to enable her to follow the same curved path as the car. If you recall from, from the lecture, we talked about uh, the clothes spinning, uh, wet clothes spinning in a, uh, the a spin cycle of the washing machine. The, the, there's holes in the washing machine, and the, the water is free to exit, whereas the clothes are constrained by the, um, the walls of the, the washing machine drum. All right, let's look at another uh, fictitious force. Okay, uh, you're on a merry-go-round and you throw a ball to a, uh, uh, a neighbor. Um, so this is a fictitious force called the Coriolis force. It's a f an apparent course, force caused by the changing radial position of an object in a rotating coordinate system. Uh, look up videos of uh, uh, a FOCO pendulum, that's F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T, a FOCO pendulum, and you'll see uh, the, uh, a very slow Coriolis effect where the pendulum appears to change direction when it's really the Earth's rotation that's causing the direction of the, the FOCO pendulum. Um, okay, uh, imagine you and a friend are on opposite sides of a rotating circular platform. You throw a ball to a, your friend, and figure A represents what an observer would see if the ball is viewed while the observer is at rest above a rotating platform. According to this obver observer, in an inertial frame, the ball follows a straight line. At, times, at time t equals zero, you throw the ball. At time t final, when the ball has crossed the platform, your friend has moved to a new position and can't catch the ball. From the friend's point of view, the non-inertial reference frame, because he's undergoing a centripetal acceleration relative to the inertial frame of the Earth's surface, he, he starts off seeing the ball coming toward him, but as it crosses the platform, it veers to one side, as in figure B. The friend on the rotating platform states that the ball does not obey Newton's first law. He claims that a sideways force is causing the ball to follow the curved path. This fictitious force is the Coriolis force. Um, this is similar, if you watch the reference frame video that I recommended, the fellow is sliding a, uh, a little dry ice puck across the table and it seems to, to go, come right back to him because the table is rotating. If you haven't seen that video, you should. It's a recommended video a couple of chapters back, I think, or maybe it's just the last chapter. Look it up. Fictitious forces may not be real forces, but they can have real effects. Uh, objects on a dashboard slide off as the car accelerates. If you, if, you know, if you're at a stop and you take off suddenly, something on the dashboard may slip backwards. Or I am guilty of, of putting like a, a cell phone or, or my iPad in a, in a, you know, in a folder, you know, putting putting my iPad in a folder, putting it on the dashboard, and when I turn there, you know, thankfully my wife is over there to catch the uh, iPad when it slides off to the so side if I turn to the left. So um, the, the, these fictitious forces, though they're not real, it's the the iPad's own inertia that wants it to keep going straight. Uh, they can have they can have real effects. The Coriolis force due to the rotation of the Earth is responsible for rotations of hurricanes and for large-scale ocean currents and also for the turning of focal pendulums. Uh, please look up focal pendulums. I may post one uh, at the end uh, uh, or in addition to the posting of the lectures. Let's take a quick quiz. Consider the passenger in the car making a left turn in the figure. Which of the following is correct about the forces in the horizontal direction? If if she is making contact with the right door. The passenger is in equilibrium between real forces acting to the right and real forces acting to the left. The passenger is subject only to real forces acting to the right. The passenger is subject only to real forces acting to the left. None of those statements are, uh, none of those statements are true. Well, which is it? Well, Remember, from the law of inertia, she wants to keep going straight, so the only force on her is the door and the friction of the seat keeping her moving. So the answer is the C, the passenger is subject only to real forces acting to the left. 
Okay, let's um, consider the experiment described in the opening storyline. If you didn't read the storyline, go ahead and read it. You are riding the, on the mad tea party ride and holding your smartphone hanging from a string. Now suppose your friend stands on solid ground beside the ride watching you. You hold the upper end of the string above a point near the outer rim of the spinning teacup. Both the initial, the inertial observer, your friend, and the non-inertial observer, you, agree that the string makes an angle of theta with respect to the vertical. You can claim that a force, which we know to be fictitious, causes the observed deviation of the string from the vertical. How is the magnitude of this force related to the smartphone centripetal acceleration measured by the inertial, inertial observer? Now, let's conceptualize this as follows. Place yourself in the role of each of the two observers. The inertial observer on the ground knows that the smartphone, ha smartphone has a centripetal acceleration and that the, the deviation of the string is related to this acceleration. As a non-inertial observer in the teacup, imagine that you ignore any effects of the spinning of the teacup. So you have no knowledge of any centripetal acceleration. Because you are unaware of this acceleration, you claim that a force is pushing sideways on the smartphone to cause the deviation of the string from the vertical. To make the conceptual, uh, conceptualization more real, try running from rest while holding a hanging object on a string and notice that the string is at an angle to the vertical while you are accelerating, as if a force is pushing the object backward. Now, we, cate we categorize this problem as the as follows. For the inertial observer, uh, we modeled the smartphone, smartphone as a particle under a net force in the horizontal direction and a particle in equilibrium in the vertical direction. For the non-inertial observer, the smartphone is modeled as a particle in equilibrium in both directions. Now, to analyze this, uh, the geometry for the spinning and hanging smartphone will be similar to that shown for the ball in the figure shown. According to the inertial observer at rest, the forces on the phone are the force T exerted by the string and the gravitational force. The inertial observer concludes that the smartphone centripetal acceleration is provided by the horizontal component of T, uh, the horizontal component being T sine theta. For this absor observer, apply the particle under a net force and a particle in equilibrium models. So here we are in the forces in the x direction the, the, are the tension times sine theta and the mass times acceleration, the centripetal acceleration. In the y direction, it's simply T cosine theta, the vertical component of the tension and uh, mg, which is the weight, uh, the mass times gravitational acceleration is equal zero. Now let's, uh, according to the non-inertial observer riding in the teacup, the string also makes an angle theta with the vertical. To that observer, however, the smartphone is at rest, so, and so its acceleration is zero. Therefore, the non-inertial observer introduces a force, which we know to be fictitious, in the horizontal direction to balance the horizontal component of T and claims that the net force on the smartphone is zero. We apply the particle and equilibrium model for this observer in both directions. And so the top is the inertial observer. This is the non-inertial observer. F prime is equal to T sine theta minus the fictitious force equals zero. And in the Fy, you'll notice it's the same, T cosine theta minus mg. Okay. Uh, these expressions are equivalent to those for the inertial observer if F fictitious equals mass times ex uh, centripetal acceleration. Um, these expressions, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, these expressions are equivalent to those for the inertial observer if fictitious, if F fictitious is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration with a centripetal, uh, where A sub C is the centripetal acceleration according to the inertial observer. Now, the angle of, we finalize this problem. The angle of the string will depend on where the upper end of the string is held relative to the teacup, uh, relative to the center of the teacup. If the string is held directly over the center, for example, the smartphone is, is not moving uh, 
in a circular path. It has no centripetal acceleration due to the motion of the teacup, and the string will not deviate from the vertical. In practice, it may deviate slightly due to the rotation of the turntables on which the teacup is mounted. Even these rides are spinning like this and going around in a circle. Um, that's what it's saying. Okay, suppose you, you wish to measure the centripetal acceleration of the smartphone from your observations. How can you do so? Okay, uh, our intuition tells us that the angle theta the string makes with the vertical should increase as the acceleration increases. By solving the equations, t sine theta, t sine theta equals mass times the centripetal, centripetal acceleration, and t cosine theta minus mg equals zero. Uh, solving these so simultaneously for the centripetal acceleration, we find that the centripetal acceleration is equal to g tangent theta. Um, so, so if we divide, if we divide the top one by the bottom one, you, we see that the t, the t's cancel out, um, the mass cancels out. So you're left with um, uh, sine theta over cosine theta equals AC over G. Uh, you multiply both sides by G and you get the centripetal acceleration equals G, G uh, tangent theta. Okay, this ends our discussion of motion in accelerated frames. The next one we will cover is uh, section 6.4, motion in the presence of resistive forces.